Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, April 2022 Wild Science webinar. Uh, we will be hearing a couple of great presentations today. Uh, we will be hearing from uh, Jeff Quinn from Fisheries, as well as Mark Barbie from Wildlife Management. Mark will be talking about uh, measuring sustainability in alligators, and Jeff will be talking about the migration dynamics of American eel. Uh, once again, remind everybody to please mute your microphones uh, while the presenters are speaking. Uh, you can uh, chime in after uh, the, we'll leave a few minutes for questions after, after each presentation. Uh, you can also uh, type your uh, question into the comments box, and I'll be happy to, to read that to the presenters. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Mark will be going first today. Mark Barbie graduated from the University of Arkansas at Monticello with a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife and Fisheries Management. And he's been employed with the Game and Fish Commission since May 2nd, 2002. And uh, by my math, that means he will be celebrating 20 years here uh, in roughly a month. Mark started as a field biologist in Region 3 and later moved up to assistant regional supervisor in 2010. Uh, Mark actually has been working with alligators since his third day on the job, and he confirmed for me before the uh, before we came on here that that was indeed a nuisance uh, alligator capture uh, on his uh, third day uh, with the agency uh, back in uh, uh, May of 20, uh, 2002. Uh, Mark also represents the agency in the Southeastern Alligator Working Group and the Crocodilian Specialist Group Steering Committee. Uh, Mark Barbie, uh, take it away with Alligators Measuring Sustainability. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about alligators. Um, so we can get this thing here loaded up here. We have an issue the other day. Hopefully everything will go smooth. Yeah. And it's not going to already. Hold on one second. We good? Don't see anything yet, Mark. All right, hold on one second. Uh, we had issues the other day, same thing. Try this now. Still won't do it. I apologize for this. No problem, Mark. Technology is not always our friend. Still nothing. Don't see anything yet. Are Are you sharing from the uh, entire screen or tab? I don't. If you you might try. If If one's not working, try try the other. There we go. Got it now. We got you, Mark. All right. Before I get into actual measurement of sustainability in Arkansas, I'd like to give a little background information about alligators in general, plus also for Arkansas. Um, May of uh, 1828 was one of the first recordings of Ar alligator in Arkansas period uh, by the killing of an 11-foot specimen on the north bank of the Arkansas River at Little Rock. And this is documented in the Arkansas Gazette, uh, the issue they run that day. Uh, so they've been around here for a while. Between 1860 and 1960, the alligator population throughout the Southwest United States were severely depleted, uh, pretty much due to habitat loss. And back then, there was no, there was no regulated hunting season. There's just, if you've seen an alligator, you want to kill it, they killed it. So with that being said, in 1961, uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission enacted regulations to protect the alligator um, in the state of Arkansas, mainly due because of the unregulated hunting was later brought on to the enactment of the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Um, that was US Fish and Wildlife Service driven act that was put into place. 
uh, not only there for the alligators, other crocodile species, but also other suite of animals as well. They were considered threatened or endangered at that given time. In 1977, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they downlisted the alligator from endangered to the threatened status, which currently today in Arkansas, it is still listed as threatened, but that's because of due similarity to other crocodilian species that are endangered. So although our numbers are good, it's still listed as such as threatened, um, just because it's similar to other species. <clears throat> and, uh, and in June of 1987, it was kind of downlisted to recovery status and subject to a five-year monitoring program. Um, the five-year monitoring program will come in key here in just a little bit when we talk about how Arkansas got to the point of where we are today um, with our alligator seasons and our hunts we have. And then in 2000, uh, Arkansas Game and Fish entered a conversation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for guys to potentially how, what Arkansas needed to do in order to have a alligator season in Arkansas. Um, like I said before, alligators are one of those species of animals that are regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as far as tagging requirements and compliance. So anything we do in court with alligators, once again, has to be vetted through them as far as approval and acceptance. <clears throat> one of the first things we had to do talking with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we had to develop basically alligator management zones. So we looked at the whole state and then we broke it down and we used pretty much geographical boundaries, major highways, rivers that would be a defended boundary that we could break them up into zones. Um, zones one, two, and three across, across the bottom is where we typical have all of our hunting activities now. Up until two years ago, zone two was considered a closed zone period, just like four and five are. Um, zones one and zone three, they've always had hunting since 2007 was the first year for public and private. And then like I said, two years ago when um, zone two was opened up to private land at large hunting. <coughs> Excuse me. When the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was in conversation with us, we had to determine how we wanted to basically look at our populations. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service allowed three methods of surveying. One is uh, nest count surveys, two is aerial count surveys, or spotlight surveys, or a combination of the above, all three. Some states, you know, the marsh places, they have areas they can use as nest counts, they can use aerial helicopters to count, and that works great for those. In Arkansas, it's not applicable. Uh, majority of ours are cypress swamps, tupelo swamps, so back where we do not have an opportunity for aerial counts. Spotlight survey lends itself here for us. And basically, um, we, it's, it's spotlight count. You go out and you count what you see. Uh, and what you're looking for is the picture below. Um, that's actually out of a lake in Florida. But it gives an example of you're looking for the red eye shines. That's what you're looking for. And then from that, we conduct a survey. AGFC adopted this in 2000 as the official survey method. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service signed off on it. They were okay with that. So then we had to establish a protocol how to do this. We conduct our surveys in early spring. Um, when the water temperature reaches approximately 75 degrees, it could be a little early, it could be a later. Uh, and we say the 75 degree mark because of activity for the alligators. Um, water temperature warms up, they get a little more active, they come on out from where they were wintering at. It's lazy for us to locate. We conduct surveys on both public and public water, private and public waterways. Um, therefore, we can have a diversity across the board as far as habitat types, bodies of water, size of bodies of water, or just in general, varying habitats. When we first started this, we first started our surveys in 2001, um, and there were 16 core locations picked out. Um, they were picked out because they knew they had alligators on them. They were old remnant populations and restocking efforts. So that's where they started from. And then since then, we have still continued those 16 core surveys, just like we did in 2001. We're still doing the same today for to show longevity, to also show our trend, which we'll see a little bit more, which falls into the APM matrix, which is essential for us to present to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that we can prove that our sustainability for alligators in Arkansas, that they allow us to keep hunting. Each route is surveyed once annually. Um, historically, we had did the surveys twice, and then we averaged the two. 
Um, we got to think it right now. What will we benefit from that? Because we're getting crunch time. We've got a narrow window from mid-April to the last of May to complete all surveys and get it generated to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Plus, also to for our tag permit draws as well as uh, allocations. So, crunch some numbers, looked at it, and there was actually a three alligator difference in a survey between one survey and two surveys, and that could fluctuate from day to day. So we went with one survey a year. We pick out the optimal night, optical condition, so we get the best bang for our buck, so to speak. <laughs> Which still allows us to get our surveys done, plus fulfill our requirements. What we're looking for out there is basically two things, harvestable or juvenile. Harvestable alligators or anything that's four feet plus or better, and juveniles are actually less. Um, we look for size classification, and we do a count. What this does when we do the recruit, well, it gives us insight to recruitment. The juvenile size, all the way down to hatchlings, when we go out at night, we can count four or five nests, which would actually be last year's nest, so they'd be yearlings. I mean, that shows us that those carried over through the winter, they survived, they made it. So that gives us an insight into what's coming on for the next year and to come. And we can see multiple age classes from varying sites too that we've historically only seen one or two. And as, as keep on going back to this too, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the driving force for us being able to alligator hunt in Arkansas. Um, data we collect, all that has to be presented to them. It's all part of the annual report that we produce each year to provide to them, which includes our spotlight, spotlight survey data, as well as harvest numbers, and then another topic we're going to discuss here in just a few minutes. This is an example here of our alligator spotlight survey form. Uh, pretty much you can see how the classification broke down, and we do it by one foot increments uh, down through there. And there's some, it's just going to be an unknown. Um, we'll see an eye shine at a distance, have no idea what the size of it is. It goes under before we get to it, so therefore it goes an unknown. Those all go in quite into the, the APM, the alligator per mile matrix we'll discuss in a minute, as far as helping determine our population in given areas. The figure on the right, I mean, excuse me, on the left kind of shows how. We determine the size um, for an animal. And pretty much from the center of his eye to the center of his snout is an inch per foot. Um, you know, eight inches, eight foot alligator. And we've compared this to known nuisance gators or harvest animals we've had our hands on, and we'll measure them. And you're within half an inch, three quarters of an inch, either side of it. So as far as in the field, it is a very reliable way of indicating length of an animal when you're out, as well as for the hunters too as well. They use the same technique as well. And like I said, the spotlight survey form gives kind of an overview. We look at water temperatures, we look at wind directions, conditions, sky, boat traffic, all those play a factor in when we're doing this. So we want to pick the best night for all when we're doing these. This brings us to alligator per mile matrix. Pretty much this right here, it shows 2009 to 2021. But we always we go all the way back to 2001, but it got really muddled and kind of unclear to read. So we broke out from 2009 to 2021. Basically, your green line is over the years, the alligators per mile that we're seeing on average. Now, it does fluctuate up and down, and that's seasonal. It could be from high water levels. It could be from vegetation growth, and it presents us to be able to see. Um, so there's a lot of variations there. But overall, the static line through the middle, the dotted median line, shows an increase from 2001 all the way to 2021. So the numbers are steadily per mile are increasing, which that gives us consecutive years of trend. We say, okay, each year we're gaining more gators, we're gaining more gators. It highlights areas of concern. Um, now, if we have an area that just drops off two or three years in a row, yeah, we will look at that because there's something going on there. Either A, habitat's changed or could possibly be, you know, um, over overhunt pressure on it with a situation like that. And once again, it's also for U.S. Fish and Wildlife compliance. Everything that will lend us to show that, hey, even though we're harvesting animals, that our population is still increased. Even at the rate we harvest more, population increases more, it's still basically a feather in our hat that allows us to keep, continue to have the green light and thumbs up for us to continue our hunt. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, like I said, and this is a regulatory agency for the gators. I mean, they're kind of the 
I guess because the driving force of this, um, they can say yay or nay um, with the results of what we produce. This is another way to kind of look at the same uh, APM matrix. Um, what is pre-harvested and then 2021 is harvest. You can see it broke down there. Um, some areas are not harvested that we do survey. Grassy Lake, for instance, in Southwest Arkansas. Um, we've surveyed it since 2001. It has never been harvested, never hunted. And the landowners over there, it will not be hunted. They just, they like watching, they're not gonna allow hunting on it, period. But for us, it is a key survey route that we do because every year it's static. You know, they don't change the water, but the alligator numbers change. Outside the seasonal variabilities of, you know, cold, you know, vegetation growth, that gives us a good indicator of what the gators are doing over there. So it kind of looks, even in the harvested areas, where we're surveying and harvesting, you know, pre-harvest there, harvest is up. So we're still increasing across both of them versus harvested nor non-harvested, which, once again, this all falls into play that supports our continued um, harvest of alligators in Arkansas. Arkansas does not have any alligator farms or anything like that. So anything, um, I should preface this, is just, you know, it's related to seasonal hunting. Um, other states do have commercial operations, which they go through the same U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regulations as well. But it's in a different category. For us, it's only sport hunting. So that kind of lends itself a little differently for us. Given the fact, too, that Arkansas, we're a little unique and that we're totally landlocked, and uh, we're one of the only states that you're allowed, that alligators exist to hunt them. This kind of gives an indication over time. Once again, we've got data that goes all the way back to the beginning, but to clarify, make it a little clearer, we broke it down into this. Um, you got tags available, um, harvest, and then the, uh, the yellow bar, which may be covered up, I'm not sure. The yellow bar is tags issued. Up until 2020, you see the, the lines, they kind of tend to not mirror each other. That was prior to us changing strategies as far as our tag allocations on private land at large. Up until then, we surveyed a piece of property and then tags were issued to that given piece of property. Well. Over time, you know that 50 tags may be issued, hunters on that prior property on my gate, 35. So therefore we got variations. In 2020, we chose to go to a zone quota on private land, pretty much to mirror the elk quota system. And now you got your lines laying on top of each other, which is what we were looking for. So we're allowing more opportunity for hunters. We still have a quota, so we're not just going over that. So even though our tags available, which you can see are below the line, we're still within our allowance with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for us to harvest in Arkansas. So just like with the other quota systems, you know, you go out on a given night, season's open, but during the night it closes, there may be 20 other people out doing the same thing. So you can still have a few over as well, but we're still within our guidelines and requirements, so we have not had an issue with that as of yet. One of the other fish and wildlife service requirements was um, outside of doing your survey, you also got to incorporate your nuisance alligator program. You've got to capture that data as well. So it can also go into the annual report as supportive information. Um, as you can see down there, you know, we give them from a variety of things. Um, mainly the, the program is designed to manage alligator and human encounters uh, via be on a roadway, um, highways, fields, uh, we even have one in in-ground swimming pool one time. So there's a various opportunities we have to uh, educate public about them. Is also to provide a service in which we can collect data, which also will help us. Um, once again, we never have an opportunity to educate too much. This data is collected. Um, we mark and we recapture. We capture an animal, we mark him and release him. Um, so therefore, in some states, you know, we'll get a return back on them. Uh, to my knowledge right now, we've had two alligators that were actually caught as nuisance in Arkansas. They left our state, went to Mississippi, and then went to Louisiana, and were legally harvested during their season because of the tags, they returned them back to us. And we can, you know, correspond with information back and forth according to that. 
this all, like I said, all plays into the alligator report, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This report is broken out as far as the nuisance part is uh, number of animals and by county. So they want to know what counties this is affecting in. And it'll it have a little more effect than just maybe you can see. But we break it out by counties, total number, and it fluctuates from year to year as well. Um, some years, as in the bottom right picture, that was the year we had nothing but rain in the springtime. Highways, roadways were flooding out. So we had gators getting in places they didn't belong. Um, it's not his fault. He just water pushed him up there, and it is what it is. And once again, this also supports our option for a hunting season. We have more business complaints. It just kind of gives a little supportive information to the issue and option for us to have a hunt. This is just a little snapshot of the state of Arkansas. Each one of those pins represents not only one, but some places up to three to four um, nuisance calls or complaints about a gator. All calls that we receive are, for lack of verified, either through a phone call or site visit. Some of these um, are, are legitimate. They're a nuisance animal that is in a uh, farm pond, they're in a driveway or roadway, somebody's property. Some of them are um, in a pond, but with a little education, people choose to leave them. Uh, now that we've gone to the zone quarrel permit, the way we're doing it, um, individuals will allow the gators to stay on their property until that fall, that September, when they themselves have an opportunity to hunt that animal. So this kind of gives you distribution of across the state, which if you remember, the southeast and southwest were our two remnant populations to begin with when we first started hunting zones one and three. In zone two in the middle, there's a few sightings in there and there's a few nuisance calls, but the harvest or the complaints is not that big in there. If you go back and look too at the complaints and on the same time scale, um, the 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 complaints have pretty much of the white line and the yellow, the, I mean, the green, sorry, the harvest. Um, as you can tell, they kind of fluctuate up and down. But in 2020, when we opened up the zone quota, you started to see a downward trend in nuisance complaint. Our harvest is going up, which kind of what we wanted to do. Uh, we allow for more private landowners to get out there and harvest the nuisance animals. The complaint would go down, harvest goes up. It's a win-win. They get the chance to harvest an animal, and the complaint issue is resolved. So that has been very popular. Uh, I have yet to find anybody that was opposed to the change we did in 2020 as far as going to a zone quota, other than the simple fact is now uh, some zones don't stay open that long. Uh, everybody's jumped on the bandwagon, and they have an opportunity. They can hunt their piece of property, or they know a buddy that has a property that has gators on it. So they will contact them, and they will make arrangements, and they hunt it. So typical, a couple of nights, the zones are closed, but overall it has received great reception with it. Hunters appreciate it. Um, the guys, you know, that work for the game of fish do as well because it releases some of the pressure on them as far as complaint issues go. And pretty much um, when you think about, you know, alligators and sustainability, you know, we want, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, we want, you know, we want hatches, we want baby gators. Um, we want baby gators to turn into one on the right side too so that's what we're looking for um and you know our survey our nuisance alligator program all of those are just small parts that go into the overall collective effort of arkansas game and fish commission in order to represent you know hey we do have a viable population of alligators in arkansas our population is growing as proof by our surveys and then the alligator uh from our matrix i mean they're increasing so harvest increases which it has you know we've had a record harvest um uh, last last two years have been above everything else so it, it's working in our favor uh so from a standpoint look you know it's a, it's a great you know recovery story you know the alligators pretty much for one time weren't even existing in arkansas um they were listed you know and it's endangered went to threatened and now recover status and then the Arkansas Game of Fish, you know, we're, we're our opportunity to the Arkansans to um, 
partake of the animal and uh enjoy the great outdoors um pretty much you know that is that's the future of alligator hunting right there you want to go from hassan's to the trophy animal you have on your right side and that is kind of what i had um i'm glad to take any questions anybody may have or back up to review something else thanks mark uh anybody you got any questions Mark, I, I had one question. You, you talked about restocking efforts. When did those occur and in what areas were those efforts uh, concentrated? There was basically two stocking efforts in the 70s and the early 80s. Um, they were over in the Southwest and then Southeast Arkansas. Um, you, I mean, AGFC got in touch with Rockefeller Refuge in Louisiana and uh, pretty much they moved animals, uh, went down there caught right at sub adults, four foot animals, few bigger ones, brought them up here. And at that time, they were looking for any, any landowner that'd be willing to put them on their property just, you know, as a restocking effort. So that's what they did. Uh, they put them on private property. We still have some of those remnant populations today from the early stockings that are still uh, some of our key points we survey right now. So those animals, not necessarily there, but their offspring are there. They're still utilizing the same property. And, uh, you're just, you know, we're getting more and more of them. All right, I got one more question. Uh, since nobody else is asking, I will. Um, those two animals that were captured as nuisance uh, gators, marked and then recovered as part of hunting in Louisiana, how, how, how far did they go? How far did they move? Well, one of them was actually caught in uh, Mississippi and one was in Louisiana. The alligator that was in, uh, mississippi he actually had left from choctaw on the wma um swam the mississippi river and was 30 miles inland north of leland mississippi there's a little oxbow over there um he was found in it uh, but if you look it was 37 miles from the mississippi river to this little oxbow but if you zoomed in and looked at it, it's connected by canals ditches and just a, a myriad of waterways that eventually ended up over there to where um, he was harvested. The one in Louisiana was actually a nuisance alligator that was caught just west of uh, El Dorado on the highway. Uh, it was released into the Washita River and it traveled down and was harvested just north of Monroe. So they've gotten in a major waterway and that's what you know, gave them a little distance, but they traveled. Um, sure. One had traveled one of his two years between one and three between the other one at the time of um, harvest. One had gained two feet, other one gained two and a half feet in length. Wow, interesting stuff. All right, anybody else got anything before uh, we move on? All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, great job. Appreciate that. A lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, next up is going to be from uh, fisheries, Jeff Quinn. We'll talk about the migration dynamics of American eel. Uh, we talked a little bit about migration dynamics of alligators there a little bit, I guess. Uh, Jeff uh, has been a stream fisheries biologist with Game and Fish since August of 1998. He works statewide on river and stream fisheries issues and is stationed out of the Mayflower office. Uh, Jeff spent a portion of his youth living on a dairy farm in west central Minnesota and grew up fishing for bluegill and walleye on nearby Lake uh, Osakis. Um, Jeff graduated in 1994 with a Bachelor of Science from uh, Winona State University in Minnesota and then earned a master's degree in zoology in 1998 from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Jeff has uh, co-authored the first editions of the Game and Fish Commission's Walleye, Paddlefish and Sturgeon, and Catfish Management Plans. Uh, he has also worked closely with smallmouth bass streams and Arkansas River fisheries issues. Uh, Jeff started working on endangered pallet, sturge and pallet sturgeon issues on his first day on the job with Game and Fish, and he has been involved in many research and management projects with paddlefish and sturgeon over the years. He's been the fish taxa team leader for the Arkansas Wildlife Action Plan since 2005. Uh, Jeff has uh, been voted by his peers as the recipient of the Mike Freeze Award for Excellence in Fisheries Biology. That was back in 2008. Uh, he has served as president of the Arkansas chapter of the American Fisheries Society and has 
uh, chair of the Warm Water Streams Committee, uh, the Southeast Division of AFS. Uh, he's co-authored 13 papers in peer-reviewed fisheries journals and uh, in 2016 co-authored with Jeremy Risley, a paper about paddlefish in the Mississippi River that won the Outstanding Technical Paper Award at the CIFWA meeting. Uh, Jeff was recently promoted to the River and Streams Program Supervisor. Uh, one of his favorite things to do is mentoring younger professionals on their career journey, and he believes that mentoring is one of the most important things that we do in life. Uh, Jeff, uh, take it away, talking about uh, migration dynamics of American Eel. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks so much, Trey. Uh, if you could please let me know if you can see this. Is everybody, uh, Trey, can you see the presentation? Yeah, we got you, Jeff. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. So thanks so much. Again, I'm Jeff Quinn, the stream, a River and Stream Fisheries Program Supervisor. And I'd like to start by introducing you to the American eel. Uh, these are female eels caught from the Washita, uh Little Missouri and Caddo River. Um, they make a, a remarkable journey. Uh, they, they are spawned out in the Sargasso Sea of the Caribbean, and it's about a 2,000 mile journey to make it to Arkansas through four, da through four dams. And so um, that's something that I've, I've been really curious with. I've been working with the species since about uh, 2012 when there was petitions to list them under the Endangered Species Act. The species was not listed in part because we collected a lot of information uh, suggesting the eels, uh, were not, the listing was not warranted. So, but we still are interested in their, their movements because it's kind of critical for them completing their life cycle. I'd like to start the, the talk also by acknowledging my co-authors, uh, Kelly Winningham has been our, uh, kind of our person putting together our surgical team, Dr. Ballard, does all of our surgeries. We're so uh, incredibly lucky to have a veterinary on staff that can do uh, the skilled skilled surgeries. I got um, uh, Chris Middog, Brett Hobbs, and Eric Brinkman have been really critical for collecting fish. Todd Slack with Erdick of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been here, been on the team since the start in 2017. Uh, I have partners with the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries and the Fish and Wildlife Service Baton Rouge office. So um, just have a large consortium of people that are helping out with this project because we're studying it over a large spatial scale. Um, so thanks to our partners. I especially want to mention again Jeff Newman at the Halsey Hatchery, who's been great to work with making sure our eels are, are doing okay. Um, and then Southwest Power and Energy help us uh, with flow releases that allow us to collect the eels. And I, I know I'm probably missing people from this list. Uh, it's a big it's a big list. I really don't have time to, to talk about everybody. Let's talk about the amazing life history of this species. Um, it's highly migratory, like I said. Um, it spawns in the marine environment, and so it spawns out in the Sargasso Sea. Um, and this is where they find what's called leptocephalus larvae, and, and it's a small planktonic larvae that eat algae. Um, so it's kind of um, a little bit uh, interesting that it begins its life as, as basically the plankton. And then uh, a lot of those drift passively through the Gulf Stream, and um, as they approach shore, they become closer to the glass eel size around you know, roughly around two inches, 50 millimeters, which are transparent. Some of these uh, uh, larvae, though, make it into the Gulf, and uh, and then eventually the fish make it up to Arkansas. The species has a large range. You can see extended from northern Canada all the way down to northern South America, although it does not occur in the Amazon basin. Um, when the, in the coastal areas, the eels pigment up and become what's called an elver. Um, the, the continental growth phase is called the yellow eel because they develop kind of a yellow pigment on them. And then uh, finally, uh, they develop a silver eel stage, which th their backs darken, 
Their belly becomes a silvery white color, hence the term silver eel. Their uh, pectoral fins elongate and their eyes get larger. Um, their uh, elementary canal, their digestive system uh, shrinks in size and their uh, gonads extremely swell. And then, and then we know they make an out migration and, and return to the sargasso sea to spawn. Um, there's not a lot known about how these eels are getting around all the dams uh, on, on our rivers. I want to point out that the American eel is one of the most valuable wildlife commodities. The glass eel is harvested um, and sent to Japan for aquaculture where they raise up those glass eels uh, to a larger size for eating um, with yugami or uh, in sushi. Um, so there's intensive harvests of adults also uh, for food, um, especially up in Canada. Um, and, and this species is declining uh, overall, uh, but primarily because of the effects of dams, harvest, oceanic conditions. And this is kind of a tangent, but um, the picture on the left uh, shows uh, here just there, the Gulf of Mexico actually has about 118 species of planktonic eels that have been uh, discovered. So it's incredible diversity and I just love this picture and I thought I wanted to share that with everybody. And you can see on the right a sequence of American eels where they, they go from uh, in a continuous fashion from plankton to looking, to looking more like an eel. And then the bottom picture is just a really cool picture of the head of, of one of these other species. In the Washtenaw River um, fish, we start seeing them, the, these eels, below our dams when they're four to five years old and about 250 to 350 millimeters. So a little bit bigger than a number two pencil and maybe closer to the thickness of a Sharpie. Um, they stay here till they're 12 to 14 years old and reach a size of about 700 to 820 millimeters. And the top fish you can see is more of a, has silver eel characteristics with a much darker back and more of the white silver um, belly. Whereas you can see the yellowing on these yellow, these eels. And every, fee, every eel we've ever collected in the state when we've looked um, using histology um, has been a female. So the study area that I'm looking at is um, the Washita Black, Red, Achafalaya River Basins. So that's kind of a mouthful, but out to the Gulf of Mexico. It's about a 650 mile path. In the upstream areas where there's yellow squares, um, we have areas that we tag the fish, um, where we captured fish for surgeries. And um, here you can see uh, Narrows Dam on the Little Missouri River. And so these are hydropower projects and they release uh, hydro peaking flows. So the flows are going up and down all the time. Um, as you go downstream, you get into the navigation project study area with Thatcher. Felsenthal, Columbia, and Jonesville dams. And we were really interested in understanding how eels are getting by these dams. And at Felsenthal, we knew there was going to be, there was proposed, um, when I started the project, drawdowns during the fall. And this is a fall, my, uh, a species that migrates in the fall. So we wondered how those, that proposed management action would impact their migration. Plus we had um, on Columbia Dam, uh, especially there was a FERC permit to put on a hydroelectric and eels can be um, killed by uh, turbines. So we wanted to understand if there were recommendations that we could make to reduce mortality at some of these dams if, uh, if indeed hydro projects are developed there. And so one of the things you'll notice about um, these navigation dams on the system, they all look roughly the same, a little bit of variation, but not much. They all, uh, at low water, they always, they kind of look like they could block migration, but at high water, I think you can notice this navigation pass, and this is designed so uh, actually a barge can uh, go over the top of the dam whenever the lock is closed due to high water. So there is a real easy mechanism to see how a migratory fish can get through. So our objectives of this project, which was started in 2017, um, are, were to determine how do dams impact migratory chronology. So uh, 
what's triggering their migration, when are they moving by these dams. We want to look at migration speeds and determine are they really getting uh, caught below some of the dams. Uh, in the area, there's a lot of dams. Is their speeds a lot lower? What, what's happening with that? And then we want to look at escapement, which is um, basically survival uh, to the Gulf of Mexico where at the point where they're exiting fresh water. We use boat electrofishing to catch the eels. Um, we did surgeries to implant the transmitters, and this is Dr. Ballard doing a surgery on an eel. We're so lucky to have a, her, a, a person with her skill level. She just put a transmitter in, and if you blink, you might have uh, missed it. It happens pretty quick. She puts internal and external sutures in the fish, and the internal sutures are really nice because eels can actually turn around and sometimes bite their sutures out, so the internal ones are kind of hidden and they can't really do that. So we're really blessed to have a skilled surgeon that'll help us do that. And the research division has been just uh, uh, fabulous to work with on this project, helping us out. Um, we set out anchored DR2 hydrophones that detect fish with tags that are emitting acoustic signals as they move by at 13 arrays. And these, um, uh, basically there's an anchor that's cabled to a tree and then underneath, and then also cabled to a buoy. And below that, we have a, a VR2, it's called. It's a hydrophone that basically listens for the signal and records it, and we can download it using Bluetooth. And then there's a, a temperature logger and a PVC shield below it at some of our stations. So some results, uh, we've tagged 112 eels in four years. We didn't do surgery one fall. We do it every fall in September. Uh, late August, early September. Uh, we have 18 BR2 set out at 13 arrays or locations. Um, we amassed a total of 20,137 detections. So it's becoming really big data and requires us uh, to do programming in R to be able to analyze it. It's so much information. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the climate during the study. Um, the fall of 2017, when we started, there was a drought that was considered extreme in South Arkansas in our study area. Right after that, we went into the wettest six months on you know, 124 years of record um, from September 2018 to February 2019. And uh, you can see here it says the record wettest out of 124 years, and that's NOAA data. And then the following year, um, we had this unbelievable hurricane season with 30 named storms and uh, a lot of a lot of people in the room or in the conference call here might remember uh, hurricane laura which was a category four and we had substantial rains after laura passed through i also wanted to mention um, my project partners in louisiana were incredible um, just unbelievable what they got accomplished maintaining the VR2 arrays during that hurricane season. Some of them, a lot of them didn't have power. Um, a lot of them didn't, um, they were, uh, some of them had their homes, if they still managed to maintain uh, the VR2 arrays. So it was really, really amazing to see that got done. <clears throat> one of our main conclusions is we're seeing a lot of variability among years, and this is one of the reasons why collecting data over a little longer term sometimes is really important. Um, this slide's a little bit complicated, so I'll walk you through it. Um, this is basically a, a flood hydrograph for the Washita River at Camden. It shows the gauge, gauge height on the y-axis um, in feet, and then the date on the x-axis. <clears throat> and so you can see the water levels in the, in the fall of 2017 during that extreme drought dropped really, really low. And then we didn't have any, any eels migrate until the Christmas. And right here you can see the migration speeds at the BR2 assembly superimposed on top of the hydrograph. And so this is showing uh, fish downstream um, during that, uh, basically it was Christmas weekend flood and in late 2017. Following that, in February, we had the sixth highest flow on record 
ever recorded at the Camden Gauge. Um, and then we had one, one eel actually migrating then, but it wasn't a true migrant. It was really kind of just slowly moving downstream. It didn't go very far down. Um, but it was re really moving slow too. Um, in fall of 2018, we implanted more tags and most of those fish moved during high water events in November and December of 28 and 19. So our preliminary conclusions, the first two year of the study is, these fish are really only moving at higher flows. Um, then we went into a period with this exceptionally wet period that I talked about was the wettest period on a big section of the United States. And we didn't see any migration whatsoever in that extremely wet period. But at the end of it, in, in the summer, one, once in July and, and several times here in August, even on a really large flood peak in August, we had some migration. Now this is really unusual. This was a new finding. Um, why are these eels migrating in August was a big question. Um, and especially noteworthy is uh, the lower Chafalaya River and uh, the Gulf of Mexico out near the Chafalaya Bay become very anoxic. Um, with low dissolved oxygen that time of year. So you think it would be maladaptive. Um, and then uh, the, we didn't put any transmitters in in the fall of 2019, but we had lots of them that were holdover fish. The transmitters lasted more than one year. And uh, we did notice for the first time some low flow migration. So the original conclusion was they're only migrating at high flow but then when we collected another year's data, we, we saw more variation, although we did have some high flows. We really, in uh, spring of 2020, we didn't see any migration. A pretty consistent pattern is, as in April, May, they're not migrating downstream. Um, but then when we start getting into the fall of 2020, the hurricane season again, um, what was really interesting is right after Laura, there's this big flood spike and we rushed to put transmitters in and fish, and immediately some of the fish took off. And so I felt a little guilty because we liked them to be in the water to recover a little while, but we had some fish that actually just really turned on the burners and moved downstream. But after, after the, uh, the, the initial part of the hurricane season in Arkansas became quite dry, uh, another one of those kind of flash drought situations, and we saw a lot of low flow movements again. And, and just to show that in the closer, um, up close, you can actually see the discharge at the Camden gauge is, um, was uh, relatively low um, during this period and we still had quite a bit of movement. So there's a lot of variation and we wouldn't have understood that uh, by just doing a, a two to three year study. One of, the, one of the things I'm really interested in because of the situation where they could put hydropower projects in on these dams is determining the hour of detection that eels start migrating through these dams. Um, in a Thatcher Dam, uh, we find that eels are migrating through um, about 11 to midnight and then at 5 to 6 in the morning. So if there's a, ever a license to do a hydropower project, then we could ask for shutdowns during those windows the season when there's lots of migration in the future to reduce uh, my mortality to the species. So there's real practical uh, management recommendations that are being made, can be made from these data. In 2020, in the fall of 2020, 18 of 49 eels migrated, which is 37% of those tagged. A lot of them that didn't migrate were relatively small. Uh, 17 of the 18 migrants succeeded to escapement and reached the Gulf of Mexico. One seemed to pause its migration, and, and I don't know the eventual fate of that animal. Um, we've had zero detections in the Gulf of Mexico in the ITAG Ocean Tracking Network or FAC networks. And what these, these are kind of um, groups of researchers that have arrays where all the, there's all these dots or listening stations for fish that have these kind of uh, transmitters in them. And so our partners on the marine system um, have had zero detections so far. 
And so um, kind of in conclusion, we've seen a lot of variability. So it's a really great thing that we're doing this over a longer time scale and, and not just doing a couple year project. Uh, although with that said, I, I, I'd like to do it a couple more years and then be done with it because it's a lot of work, but we're uh, starting to transition into looking at another one of our migratory uh, Alabama shad. And finally, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening in. Uh, this is an eel. Uh, this is the last time we get to look at it. When, it, when it's released after surgery. And it's certainly a magnificent uh, a fish and it's been a real honor and privilege to be able to work with them. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions for Jeff? Jeff, one that immediately comes to mind, What? What was sort of the genesis of, of initiating this study? Why did you decide to start looking at, uh, at American eels? Yeah, we, we, we started to uh, look at American eels um, originally because of the endangered species listing. And then, uh, then we knew that we had a, a lot of, uh, we knew how to catch them basically after that. So we knew we could do a telemetry project and then we, uh, when we knew there was going to be drawdowns at Felsenthal Dam, and I think Columbia Lock and Dam had the FERC relicensing permit come through in about 2014. So we knew that um, there could be a need eventually. And then also I, I worked on Remble Dam relicensing way back in 2000. And its license lasts for 50 years, but eventually it'd be good um, the next time it's relicensed. If there's uh, you know any way we can use some of the information from a project like this to to make management recommendations during FERC relicensing. You only get one chance every 50 years, so you really need to have you know, all the data collected and analyzed and all your ducks in a row if you're gonna have successful negotiations. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, any, anybody else? Uh, I, see, I see a lot of uh, uh, comments. Uh, great job to Jeff and uh, Mark both. Uh, seeing no additional questions. We will wrap things up. Uh, Mark, Barbie, Jeff, Quinn, thank you both so much. Uh, a couple of fascinating presentations. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you next month uh, on the May iteration of the Wild Science Webinar. Take care, everybody.